Okay, do you do you want to start us off, Will? Yeah, happy to, Lorenzo. Thanks for inviting myself and Jackie to join you today um, for this series of uh, Maldaba-powered uh, webinars that you're running over the year. I think this is the second of four that you're hoping to do this year. Um, if we'd maybe do some introductions, uh, uh, and for those joining us, I won't put you on the spot, um, but if you can just perhaps put where you're from, uh, uh, your name and and, and your, your role, your organisation in the chat, that'd be lovely. Um, we're going to run this as a little roundtable in the way that uh, uh, Lorenzo has been running them previously. So uh, we're going to put some questions. Uh, once we've introduced the panel, we're going to put some questions out uh, to the panel to, to, to chew through this this week's theme, this month's theme is all about how do you sustain uh, the innovations you're piloting and uh, move out of what uh, is commonly known as pilotitis, this perpetual cycle of piloting that we all know so well. Uh, how do we move to that absolute magic golden moment of something becoming BAU? It becomes spread, it's, it's scaled, people are using it uh, and you've moved on from, from that period of, of piloting. So we're going to hear a little bit from uh, a couple of folk, including myself, that I've got experience in that space. And then I'd love to hear from people's perspectives and reflections. This is being recorded uh, and it will be then shared uh, through Lorenzo's, uh, through Maldaba's uh, uh, mailing list um, uh, through their social media channels as well. Um, so firstly, I'm William Lilly. I'm a director at the Health Innovation Network Southwest. We are funded to scale innovation. Uh, we're funded by NHS England. Um, and we are, there are, we are one of 15 health innovation networks across the country and we've been uh, working with Maldaba uh, over the last year or so uh, in supporting their work here in the southwest. So we uh, and I live in the southwest region, which is Cornwall, Somerset uh, uh, and Devon. Uh, so it's lovely to uh, to be here on this panel. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Lorenzo to introduce yourself and then to Jackie uh, and then we'll work through the feed and start answering some of those questions. Um, Lorenzo, over to you. Thanks, Will, and and thanks for um, chairing today's session. It's it's much appreciated. So yeah, I'm uh, Lorenzo Gordon. I'm one of the co-founders and directors at Maldaba, who've been around since 2002 and focus on uh, innovation and creativity in the public sector, specifically um, developing and providing web and mobile digital solutions and collaborating with the public sector in order to articulate, identify, define, um, specify problems and then look at how we can solve them and, and look at what the solutions can be and then deliver those solutions with, with our partners in, in health and, and in social care. I'm really excited to talk with you and Jackie today about what are the challenges around pilotitis, what do we mean by that, and, and how do we move forward to actually deliver sustainable change in the public sector? You're on mute, uh, Jack, uh, Thanks, yeah. Lorenzo. There's a little bit of background noise and just hearing there as well. I don't know if somebody wants to mute themselves. Yeah, I think it, Jackie, may be background noise from your end. Oh, okay. <laughs> not do, you want like to do, yeah. do you want to introduce yourself, Jackie? Okay, I'm Jackie Dodwell. Um, I'm a head of um, service for um, actually for a pilot, workforce pilot, uh, currently in Tower Hamlets. Um, my background is um, I'm a health visitor and I've been a nurse manager for a number of years, and I've worked with uh, Lorenzo and Moldova on a previous uh, pilot um, in a previous organisation. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, OK, so um, we're going to start with the first question uh, for us to consider. What do we mean by pilotitis? Uh, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Lorenzo to kick us off uh, and then Jackie and then I'll come in with some thoughts too. Um, thanks, Will. Uh, for me, pilotitis means trying to do something differently, but without properly engaging necessarily with with the system as it stands at the moment it means doing things outside of normal working practices and business as usual and setting it up as a special project and the reason that is problematic is that all of the perceptions that go along with it is that it's inherently something that is going to be short term and so it runs the risk of sort of sowing its own seeds of of defeat before you even start because if staff 
who are already overstretched know that something is not going to be around for very long, why would they engage in it? And if you have demonstrated the effectiveness of something elsewhere in the sector, but not in that particular geography, why do you need to constantly re-demonstrate it with a series of different pilots that staff might quite reasonably assume will be short-lived and, and they can just ignore? Really helpful. And Jackie, what does this word mean to you in your work? I suppose it's the, um, I agree with everything Lorenzo said particularly, but it's um, the um, looking at from a point of view, if you've got um, staff who have overstretched, actually having mm. that uh, time and uh, capacity. So it's capacity to be able to implement um, mm. a pilot that you may be um, really, really enthusiastic about, but actually you've still got the day job to do. So that in itself is um, an issue and you're looking at um, so from a point of an organisation point of view what is the real long-term strategy really isn't it what's your long-term yeah. vision to be able to to do this and some people have been around the block a few times and have seen it done it got the t-shirt and gone oh do we have to do this again but sometimes it's slightly better next time round. <laughs> Fantastic, Jack. Really good reflections, both. I think just to add to those, absolutely. So firstly, piloting is, is, is fantastic. I mean, uh, piloting is that uh, critical place to generate some real world evidence, to understand the appetite, to understand the potential barriers to getting this adopted. So it's a fantastic first step uh, when you're engaging uh, a local site. Uh, it's that way to really understand your context, um, to, to pilot something. Um, but it isn't a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. Uh, it is one step, sorry, to to, to where you want to go. Um, and as you say, Jackie and Lorenzo, there are some big barriers there that, that sort of mean we're, we're paralysed in that piloting phase and we, we, we never quite mature from it. And that is often, as you say, Jackie, capacity funding. Um, and my only other addition probably is is foresight vision, because I see a lot of these things are brought in through excitement of testing, got this new thing, this often, uh, dare I say, sort of digital innovation, but not always. Um, and it's often got some of that amazing sort of set of early enthusiasts, adopters. Um, but then the wider community that you then need to, to engage with to get something procured, which are folk that perhaps weren't in that exciting part of the journey, uh, are often a, 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 a sort of uh, left maybe towards the end of a process uh, and, and we haven't quite engaged them. And there are lots of other reasons too why we sort of get stuck into that piloting phase um, but there are a, a positive thing about piloting is a really good thing and it's really you know quite healthy to have a system where we are regularly piloting um, but it isn't healthy if we're forever there and it can have as you say Lorenzo some uh, damaging implications because it can uh, 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 set us in this perpetual finding funds every year and never quite cementing something but that's pilotus, the pilotitis what does what do we mean by spread and scale uh, uh, um, what is it to scale something, Lorenzo, from your experience? Well, and actually to, to link those two things together, Will, so I will, I will answer your question. Um, I completely agree that it's, it's reasonable when you're in a new context, a new geography, a new customer, you want to perhaps do a phased rollout or you want to be able to start small and, and progress. And I think that those are all very sensible things. And as you say, kind of just testing something and making sure that it fits what you need is um, a really important part of taking your colleagues and, and your staff with you on, on a programme of change. But I think a lot of it is about the intention, the mindset and the paradigm that one goes into these projects with, because it's yeah. one thing to say, well, we'll pilot it for six months and then we'll look at the results. And if we think that's OK, then we might commission it fully versus saying, OK, we're committed to doing this and we want to do it. What we're going to do is start small, see what works, which bits don't tweak it and change it to make sure that it works best for our organization and then continue along that journey to to spread and scale and one could even put um gate posts in at those um the, those milestones to say well we need to make sure that there are a sufficient number of people using it or that it is having a sufficient change so to answer your question about what do we mean by spread and scale within an organization we mean that it is being used by everyone who should be using it that, that it's kind of really embedded as business as usual and that it is 
effectively almost in a positive way kind of forgotten about because it's just part of your daily tools whatever it is either behind the scenes or front line with with the people that that one is supporting i think from a commercial provider point of view which is obviously what we are what we're looking for is is to build on each project and say well look we made a success of it over here let's now get a similar organization on the other side of the country to also be using it so that we get kind of a, a bigger footprint and traction and we can help more people by implementing those solutions across the UK, for example. Really helpful, Lorenzo. Jackie, what does scale and spread mean to you uh, moving from that pilot from your own experience? Okay, uh, so sometimes it's um, um i've been involved in national pilots um, yeah. so different different to yeah and i'm currently doing one at the moment um so that's really uh, funding's coming out elsewhere so you're able to recruit and you'll be able to to test the functionality of whatever we, we wanted to do and then you're able to influence that um national program which is really really helpful because actually you take in lots of pilot sites across the country so it's not just one area particularly so um yeah so that can be a, re a really really positive from a point of view some of the smaller ones in you know when it's in an organization it's about um trying to it's having all the buy-in from all the stakeholders within the organization so that you're not spreading the the pilot too thinly um, and then because I think everybody can say yes it's a really good idea but actually if you haven't really got the real buy-in then you're almost starting off to fail as you you know starting off to fail really which is a shame because everybody's enthusiastic about it but um, yeah you need that real you need a real committee don't you that um, task and finish yeah. group to really sort of take it off and report back that reporting mechanism so that you can actually continue and it's that change that you do along the way so having um, the scrutiny about right, okay it didn't quite work what can we change to, to do that and having the authority to be able to do that I think is really important. Say a bit more about some of the experiences you had there, Jackie, from a local and a national. Mm -hmm. um, just to add some reflections. So obviously, scale and spread is something that my own organisation and 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 uh, myself have considered a lot. With there's great written work actually that some of our networks have, have, have published on on the subject of scaling and spread, unique to the NHS. And obviously, we're we're a little bit agnostic, I think, in in today's session, but obviously thinking primarily around social care, the NHS, but scaling up of spread can exist in every industry and I suspect the challenges and issues are probably the same be it agriculture aviation or, or, or health or social care um, but I, I will put some links to some of the, those things in, in the chat a little bit later uh, but it's, uh, for us it, it, you know spread is is the absolute you know holy grail of, of what we are aim to do we want something be it a digital innovation in the work that we do which is often digital but it could also be medical devices could be ways of working um, uh, you know, our, our effort, our endeavour is to ensure that it is, as you say, Lorenzo, that good practice, that good piece of innovative practice is, is in, in, in the hands of, of many people as possible um, and is becoming routine practice. Um, and we can do ourselves as a network out of a job eventually. So it becomes uh, institutionalised, if you like. Um, um, and, you know, to reach that, though, is great effort. And I love a phrase that somebody shared with me is what got you uh, uh, to do the, you know, what got you here isn't what's necessarily going to get you to the next uh, phase. And I think that's so true of piloting, that initial group, that initial galvanising energy, as you say, Jackie, to get you set up, to get you started, isn't necessarily the skill set or the team mix that you then need to get every ward in your hospital or every department across the local authority or, or every uh, small business adopting a particular practice. So it really is, um, you know, uh, considering the the, the real diversity of skills and capabilities and technical skills, which in a way, I suppose, when you're piloting, you're sort of touching wood. You don't want to um, uh, um, be arrogant and say you're going to be successful. And thus you are often having to start with finite resources. But there is that maybe that attention to the conditions that are going to need to be there if you are successful. Is this the right context to actually even be piloting? Is there even the strategic direction? Is there even potential resources to scale up? All those kinds of criteria, I think, are probably worth almost thinking right from the beginning. Look, if this is successful, how are we going to scale this in nine months, 12 months time? And my, my sense is, is that we're so infused, we kind of get straight, let's just get, we're often very action-orientated folk, aren't we? We want to get straight on, get doing it. 
And then we find, as you say, Jackie, Lorenzo, nine months down the line, oh, actually, this is not even in the strategy of this organisation. In fact, they're about to introduce a new electronic patient record, which will make this absolutely impossible. Oh, we didn't know about that. So, Lorenzo, I'd love to hear a few sort of your sort of barriers a little bit and actually some of your learnings of what's worked and what hasn't worked uh, when piloting and trying to then move to that next brave stage. Well, I think there's um, the, 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 there's a something that Jackie said that really struck with me when when Jackie was talking about the, the task and finish group, because um, it is one thing for a challenge or a problem to have been identified and to bubble up to to board level and commissioners to agree that there is a problem here to be solved and then to look to procure a solution to solve it and with the best will in the world and and we've seen it ourselves a number of times it's quite easy to fall into that trap of thinking well I procure this solution therefore I have solved the problem and what isn't done is and what you were both talking about is that huge amount of human work, both from the provider, so people like Maldaba, but also from the purchasing organisation, so NHS trusts or, or local authorities or social care providers, um, to actually say, if we're going to implement this, what needs to change? And all of those questions you were asking, Will, about is, is, is the mood there right? Have we correctly identified the problem? Is the organisation in a state where it could adapt and, and could it take it up, up to full level? Because, and we touched on this in the, in the first webinar, which is available on our YouTube channel, I will hasten to add, um, that you know, digital, uh, digital isn't a solution really to anything. It is an enabler, it is a tool that can enable the solution to happen but the solution is is always human and so if you're going to commission something and then say well we want to scale it up and we want it to be a success and we want to start small and see how that works then you as the client organization also have a responsibility to say have we got the resources in place have we got the infrastructure in order to make it so have we got those task and finish groups in order to be able to start the rollout identify the problems work with those problems directly address them in order to then improve the rollout and see this as a success and you know again to be fair to commissioners when they're on an annual um, financial cycle sometimes that's really really hard when we were speaking to commissioners recently and they were saying it's great to see that this is your annual cost for for uh, it was relation to a primary care product that, that we're developing they're saying but we can only commission it on an annual basis and what we would want is assurance that your fees are not going to change over the next five years because if this rolls out across for example an ICB we can't be in a position where we then have a tool that's really valuable and then we're a hostage to changing costs which is a really reasonable thing to say and it is a really good example of how the structures for commissioning and adopting don't quite align in the public sector with what the commercial sector is is trying to do and they said we would rather that you charge slightly more but gave us a guarantee in writing that your costs are not going to change for the next five years because then that would give us the assurance that we could really commit to this project which i thought coming from a commissioner was was a really enlightened approach really helpful and it'd be good to maybe unpack some of that Lorenzo when we go to that next question about how do we structure for success because I think there are some really you know helpful tips there for others when 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 embarking on a pilot uh, particularly in getting some of those you know later stakeholders that hold the purse strings right up front giving you some of that early tacit knowledge that can be sort of gold dust and I'm really quite scary if you haven't effectively addressed it. I'd love also to hear the sort of um, the human side of piloting both being the piloting team uh, but also uh that the the you know not in all cases but a lot of cases we're talking about smes and, and small businesses and medium businesses that are trying to sort of you know introduce a particular innovation but jackie from a human side um uh, i'd love to hear some reflections of 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 what it takes to to make a, a pilot a success and um you know the kind of leadership uh, that has to go in often going against the grain dare I say you know when you're introducing something you often you know I always feel like piloting teams are often sort of putting their heads above the parapet and saying you know what I've, I, I know there's huge problems I've actually got a solution oh you know that and you're sort of putting yourself out there a little bit I just love to hear the sort of the emotional the the personal and the leadership side because it ain't all just about having a fancy business case and you know and a really great slide deck 
think it's a bit more than that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, de- yeah, definitely. Um, I suppose um, when you've got something that's nationally run, it's probably slightly different, but you still have to be able to engage everybody to be able to say what it is and people go, but why us? You know, what's it going to do? How are we going to get the staff? So there's all that sort of thing that you, you need to do. You've got to recruit the staff and um, you've got to train them depending on what it is that you're implementing. So you've got all that and and keeping the, the you know, the, the normal staff who are there, you know, sort of um, up to date with what's going on. And that communication is quite difficult. I mean, one of the pilots I was involved in was way before um, before COVID. So communication was meeting people on a on a face to face basis. Um, When you've got COVID involved, it becomes much more difficult. Now, while people think that Teams is a great way to communicate, but people aren't always present. So it's about so it's really really hard. It's really tough. You know, yes, you're on screen or you're not on screen with your camera. People are doing emails at the same time. So it's that trying to get that communication so people understand it. And that's my current um, problem with the with the uh, pilot I'm I'm, I'm leading on now um, Mm -hmm. is to make sure that the the the, um, the, you know, the substantive team know all about it so they can put the referrals in. And all that thing, and understand where they fit into it, and yeah. we're not t- taking over somebody's um, post or anything like that. So, which is, you know, people are very genuine. Yeah, it's genuine, genuine concerns. Actually, we're trying to enhance something, um, which will be good in the in the long term if if the pilot works. We don't know yet. We're we're working on mm. lots lots of different strands. And going back Mm. to the other one, which um, Lorenzo and I were involved in, I I came in about halfway through that pilot. So very different to setting it up um, because the previously um, person had left the organisation. So trying to, one, find out what was going on, understand it at breakneck speed, realise what what was going on wasn't working and sort of try and um, have it in in a different part of the organisation. So that in itself was challenging they didn't know anything about it even though the previous lead was in that part of the organization so that you'd got that you hadn't got those um the um ground work done so you're trying really hard to do it knowing that you'd got you know less than 18 months left of the pilot so yeah so mm, ticking along hmm. mm. so yeah so we tried lots of different things um my dad were really good um, and they actually provided us with, we did some lots of training online, which wasn't what didn't work for this particular team. So actually getting somebody to come down and train them from Moldova was by far the better um, way to do it because everybody, everybody learns differently, don't they? So, yeah, and that's really. really important to understand that. And yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah. so that, was a, that was an important one. And it's the, how do you recruit the um, the clients? Uh, into this was yeah into into the pilot to explain it in such a way that they understand it so that they can take it forward. So and that's the other that was another challenge really as well particularly. And you say uh, it's the day it's the day job that people have. The team were enthusiastic, but actually it's trying to do it, something else to explain when you're doing a nursing assessment, which will take you a long time. And then, oh, by the way, I want to want to um, to explain about the, this um, innovation as well, which is tough. Hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm obviously really conscious of the, of the things we've not yet talked about, the, the need to have structured evaluations around these pilots to hmm. really have the kind of technical frameworks to ensure that they are effectively implemented. But I'm just really struck by often the absence in talking about the human side of of mm. trying to pilot, and you know, it, it, and I and I and you know the the sort of uh, how do they describe non technical social skills? You know, it is all about communication, isn't it? It's telling stories, mm. really, really committing people to make me challenge their practice a little bit, and that is really quite scary. And and you are often going against the grain in customary practice that's quite well ingrained and and it's fair to say you've probably got a fair few people that want want you to fail a little bit as well some some people don't like um technical stuff you know we've still got a workforce that you know would prefer to just go out and you know see people and you know having to have a computer and laptop and document that way is you know 
we, we're dragging lots of people along, you know, not everybody, although it's, a, you know, an expectation, but some people just don't like it. So that's... Yeah. Just on that point, I uh, w one of our, our rollouts um, many years ago now um, with uh, Community Mental Health Trust, and we were working with um, various clinical staff and the physiotherapists, the OTs, the speech and language. They 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 got it. They understood, and and their work is is quite procedural anyway, and it fitted with them, and and they were off and running. And the, the group that were noticeably not doing that were arguably were one of the most important groups were the community nurses and they, they were not engaging. And what came back to me was, was that um, what I needed to do was go and have a retraining session with them. So I said, absolutely fine. And we organized it and there was a room of 35 of them and I went up there, but I had no intention of actually retraining them because I knew the problem wasn't anything to do with the technology. And we just spent a lot of time looking at case studies and saying, what's going on with this individual? What, what are the challenges they're facing? Can we see how the introduction of this is helping them? And can we see how the introduction of this helps people like you, the community nurses, when they're on the caseload. And then let's deal with, are there people on your own caseload who, who are like this? And there were a lot of individuals there who kind of said, well, you know, I, I, I don't do technology, um, which was interesting because they all had smartphones and they all they all did online banking. And this was no more complicated than, than that. And actually, I got them just playing around in groups so that they there was peer support, they could work it out together using the technology to understand how to enter information, how to access the information, how it was uh, technology for people with a learning disability, uh, me now, so it was using multimedia. And at the end, there was only one person who was still kind of a bit negative and a bit hesitant. And the rest of the room, 34, kind of got it and understood it. But you need that human interaction. You need that time. And and what came from that was that we then got the strongest um, stream of referrals, the most referrals coming most consistently from the community nurses because they'd engaged. But you have to spend that time with people and understand, well, what, what's the barrier? It was nothing to do with the technology. It wasn't even really anything to do with the project, but it was about giving them time to articulate what their yeah. concerns were, yeah. what their hesitancies were, and then allowing them space to, to talk about it and supporting them through it, not telling them they were wrong, but helping them understand actually how those could be overcome. And that was one three hour session. And we yeah, it, yeah, it's really so helpful. It does really strike me that there's a real art in how to implement a pilot. And that often my experiences are that teams can be quite under-resourced in when they're trying to pilot. Often, as you say, Jackie, increasingly now in a post-COVID world, we're having to deliver completely virtually. So we're not being able to build that relationship time, which is so, as you say, Lorenzo, so central. You know, just really walking with people, really getting to know their context. And if you can't even go into it, which has been the problem with, say, in the world of hospitals that I've worked, you often may not be able to engage in sites sometimes post-COVID. It, it can be really challenging. And also, I'm really, oh, there's a bit of noise, Jackie, your end. I don't know if you want to <laughs> <laughs> I need to mute you. No, sorry about that. There might also be um, pressures on the piloting team. So I have a, an example uh, um, where um, the person leading a pilot, this was uh, in an A&E department many, many years ago, one of my first pilot projects, uh, and the person leading it that we had in place was actually going to be made redundant at the end of the pilot. So the person leading this pilot is possibly staring at their own potential, you know, sort of uh, extinction at the end of this project. And, they're, and that's terrifying. And thus then the pressure to succeed, the pressure to make this work, you know, is really on that on the, on that person's shoulder and the team around them. And I, I do really, again, I'm really conscious that often these things are set up with high expectations, but they might not succeed. And I also have another example of a pilot, uh, which I have spoken about a fair bit, actually, which was uh, proven to be uh, uh, not very good. And I remember as a young project manager being really terrified of that potential outcome and really quite embarrassed by it. And, you know, and, and sort of, you know, we, we sort of sat on it as an organisation for a while, but then actually became uh, it became a bit of a folklore story for us as an organisation to really talk about failure and the importance of actually not all your hypotheses will go 
right and actually you should be designing it very with the mindset that this might not be successful but actually at the end of it we're going to learn something but it is really challenging isn't it and I so I have a lot of uh, warmth to the piloting team at the heart of these things but thinking about how we then structure for a, an effective pilot, be it a pilot that might suggest it's not useful for this context or it's fantastic, it should be uh, 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 scaled up. Could we just hear a little bit more from both of you and and, and I'm, I can chip in with some reflections and it might also be good to go to the chat because there's loads of lovely suggestions coming through from folk that are on, on the call about what are the sort of ingredients to make this a successful pilot. I think we've already heard a few, but how do we, how do we structure for a, a, a successful outcome? And I'm, I phrase it in that because the pilot might not be uh, successful in terms of actually this this context isn't right for this innovation. That's OK. That's partly why you're piloting. But how do we structure these things in the right way? Lorenzo, any thoughts from you and then Jackie? Yeah, and no, thanks for the question, Will. And I think it ties in with a question we've had from the chat as well about can we share examples of where pilots have been successful and then scaled up? So I'll, I'll try and address both. I think um, from from our point of view, what we want is the reassurance that there is a genuine commitment from the organisation that's commissioning this to give it an honest chance and an honest chance in both sense, as in give it sufficient resources and time for it to be a success and also allow for it to be a failure. Because as you've said, Will, a, a successful pilot doesn't necessarily mean that the that the product's going to be commissioned because it may not be the right fit now that doesn't make it an unsuccessful pilot if you've piloted it properly and it doesn't fit then you have your answer and and that's an important one to to know but you can only know that if you've in my kind of language given it a fair chance and what i mean by that is given it sufficient resources from the team who are procuring it in order to have the knowledge the local knowledge of the staff and and the landscape to work with you know, people like ourselves at Maldarba to say, how will we bring this in? What is a way that is sensitive to the internal politics that are going in in an organisation and staff's kind of genuine concerns of things like, is this to replace me down the line or is this going to increase my workload? These are all really important and really genuine kind of concerns that people have that must be addressed because ultimately, this is more about hearts and minds than it is about a simple transaction of use this tool because you can deliver whatever you like. If you don't get your staff on the ground to use it, then it's it's a waste of time. And Maldaba's point of view is always when we have these projects that we need to work with a cross section of the organisation. So, yes, we have the senior sponsors and the people procuring it who say, yeah, we want to spend money on it. But you need to have people who are on the front line and people who are managing those on the front line say, yeah, we can see that there's a benefit, not just for the people we're serving and supporting, but for us in ourselves. And if they don't see that, then it's hard to understand why they would sign up to it. And, and to answer the question that was in the chat of successful ones is when it's been precisely that is, for example, when we were working in Humberside with, with Hear Me Now, it was when the therapist could see that it would benefit them by using it because they at that point were going out to social care several times a month because of the high turnover of social care staff and re-educating social care on supporting people with a learning disability time and time again. Things like wheelchair management, postural management, how you support them in hydration and feeding them. And actually what they found is that by using Hear Me Now, they could record videos, they could put on multimedia, they could add images, they could put files there. And that was a huge saving for those staff to carry out their workload much more efficiently while still delivering high quality beneficial care to the person with a learning disability. So it's when you get those stars to align, that's when you are starting to make something a success from our point of view. Eureka, <laughs> I like that, it's a great segue. So Jackie, for, for you, what does make these stars align for you from your experience? Okay, um, I suppose for me, it's the um, the vision about what it is that you're trying to achieve yeah. um, and bringing everybody along with you to be able to do it. And that sounds very easy, <laughs> but um, but 
but it's also that bit about that sustainability, particularly. So the first one that the, the national pilot that I was involved in um, in 2013 was very much OK. Well, well, it was a success. We achieved 86 percent, which was amazing. Um, it was an immunisation pilot. Um, and but then it was like, OK, right. So how do we so? You know, the scalability about how it goes into business as usual is the um, the worry for everybody. Um, and actually, it, that was taken away nationally. They decided to scale it down to, to be able to implement it uh, nationally. So that was that was great, particularly so people were less worried about how you implement something on a, you know, a, a whole organisation or a whole age group um, part. Um, compared to what we did as a pilot particularly but uh, but being able to influence that was a really big thing for the whole team to be actually part of it to tell you what we what was successful what the worries were um you know sort of um, we were using a system that doesn't link in with gp practice so you've got all of those um uh, risks involved which is really important to, to work out what they are and know what they are so that you can address those and to to to, to you know, mitigate them as much as possible so it's really so really important so that was a really good um good one particularly to, yeah. to as, a, as a positive yeah really good to hear that jackie i think to add uh, a couple well maybe one from uh my current organisations uh, experience. And I've written, I did a little blog actually, uh, not blog, podcast recently about it, I'll put a link in, uh, which was a national programme called Presat, uh, which was all about offering magnesium sulphate uh, to women in preterm labour that could really reduce the incidences of cerebral palsy. And I, I like this example partly because it's very emotive, it, it's a very impactful uh, innovation, but it's an innovation that's been around for quite some time. We often think of things being shiny new things that that are you know are fresh and that have been done. But actually, this is something that 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 had been tested, had good evidence behind it, um, but but was not in routine practice. And what was really interesting about this was that there was a real emphasis, uh, and the the precept is an acronym. So it's, you break, you got put a link in, you can see the, the full description of it. It's just, it was essentially a an implementation program to really Im improve the uptake of it in a, in a in a hospital and within teams in that hospital and it was essentially a really great set of resources and it was also some capacity built into the team to really go on a on a on a on a on a uh, uh, supported resourced endeavor to try and increase the uptake using great practice from other sites around the country so it was really interesting sort of packaged if you like pilot implementation program uh, to really see if we can galvanize uh, uh, interest and commitment, but it had a number of, I think, success factors. Uh, one of which I think is of, of having that big strategic national drive to improve uh, maternal care, and 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 uh, you know, really helpful to have that. You know, big you know direction. We've got to improve care for for for, for women in in in, in labour. Uh, uh, but also, you know, timing as well was really helpful, and there were a number of. Uh, um, evaluations that were going on at the time that were really supporting the, the use of this program and it, everything sort of gelled a little bit and I do think timing sometimes it's just not the plan. it's really hard as it but sometimes you can see the evidence you can see but the, the the politics isn't there the the framework the sort of uh the the, the cycle as you said earlier Lorenzo and commissioning might not be there um and you know and 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 it might not be just the right sort of time for the teams at the moment there might be sort of change programs going on or whatever uh, but timing, I think, has is, is often been such an important, difficult to, you know, promise kind of condition uh, uh, to, to ensure that those stars align. I also think that the, this particular precept, I think having something really led by the frontline team, I'm really quite passionate about this, you know, and I think, you know, whether or not you're an innovator outside looking to implement something or an innovator within looking to implement something and pilot it. I think really galvanising frontline experience, frontline teams to really feel like they're owning this change and it isn't imposed upon. And sadly, a lot of innovations, well, not sadly, actually, just by the nature of it, a lot of innovations come outside um, and they're often brought in by, you know, one or two fantastic enthusiasts. But, you know, critical next step then for that said enthusiast is to really galvanise uh, the teams around them to feel like this is something they're part of and that they really care about. And um, that's very hard to do. And it takes great skill. And I, I love there's a question that's just come in, actually, which is, is there a personality type best for driving a pilot? And I, 
I think that's really interesting. I don't know if anybody's got reflections on great piloters that you've worked with, including yourself, of course, as piloters. But what do you think the personality sort of set of skills and things you think you need to to be successful in piloting? I I always look for two very specific personality types in an organisation when we first start engaging with a team. So you know when. Uh, when when we might first start be working with Jackie and her team as as the implementers, I would be saying to Jackie that there, there, there are two sorts of people within your organisation that it would be great to have kind of first contact with, and the first is those people who are they're, they're both front line, but they're people that the first group are people who are incredibly capable and well respected and and carry if you like almost the admiration of their colleagues in what they do they're always at the front of everything they're the sort of person you could give additional work to even though they're horrendously busy because they'll just get it done and they'll get it done to an excellent standard who understand the need for a project like the one you are piloting and will grab it with two hands and enthusiastically run with it and the reason that you want those people on is as a peer influencer they will do much more to bring their colleagues with them and change the culture than i for example or a a senior commissioner could ever do within that organization they they carry a cachet that i could only dream of the second group are the people who are quite loud and quite vocally antagonistic both generally within the organization but also specifically to the project and the reasons for that are because those people exist no matter what you do and if you ignore them there is a real risk that they will be throwing spanners into the works and disrupting your project so ignore them at your peril but beyond that I tend to find that their objections fall into one of two categories either their reject their objections are legitimate in which case engage with them and show them that you are responding to their legitimate criticisms and bringing something else out of it and therefore your pilot will be better or their criticisms are illegitimate in which case spend time with them work through that with them help them to see that actually whatever that criticism about it's nothing to do with your project because if you can bring those people round to your way of thinking if you can get them actually to be a positive collaborator on the project they also carry a huge amount of sway with their colleagues and they will be a far greater evangelist for the project than they would ever be or anyone else would ever be if they were antagonistic to it so those are the people I look for but at a kernel you need someone like Jackie who is just going to be really on it knows what needs to be done knows how to do it maybe quite quiet with it all but will actually be the engine that drives all of these things because it has to be on a on a day-to-day basis that you get a project going in order for it to be a success very satisfying i must have it must have been lorenzo to turn the, the sort of initial skeptics into into real advocates and and that's a real skill isn't it to engage and you've got to be quite um quite open i think to failure to to the fact that there, there might this might not work for this context and that takes a bit of bravery as a, as a pilot to snip to say look you know and you have to almost be look you know, I, I'm I'm almost a little bit agnostic here. I, I you know, obviously passionate about the solution, want to test this to see, but actually, you know, I, I'm open minded. This might not work for this context. And we're both, you know, as both parties, you know, we have to sort of engage in that. But Jackie, from your your sense in terms of uh, personality types and how would you how would you describe your personality as a as a pilot? <laughs> um I think once I understand you you need somebody who understands the project, don't you? yeah Um, from a point of view so to be able to so um my first meeting with lorenzo um was actually to you had to explain it to me because i'd yes i'd got some idea from the person who was leaving but not really because they hadn't explained it so right what do i need to do where do who do i need to contact so it's all of those things and making those relationships particularly and then being able to sell it to the team particularly so it's that communication so we've talked about that quite a lot but it's actually for me that was it and bringing the team along as much as you can with their day work particularly we certainly found it was that was probably some of the challenges particularly but yeah for me it's my it's yeah it's my enthusiasm if you like but as Lorenzo says I do probably do it quite quietly but you can tell 
with somebody who's leading on it is whether they've got the drive and whether they they're committed to it so it's that commitment isn't it to it as well to to see it through and to come up with to work with people to come up with solutions so being solution focused um yes because there'll be a few challenges along the way that you can have to try and work through absolutely yeah because it's not going to be plain none of none of the pilots have been on a plane sailing you've got to be able to go well this hasn't worked what else can we do to do it we're not going to give up yet let's try something else yeah and involving the team within it to do that because it doesn't all come from me it's got to be other people to be able to do that um yeah so really helpful Jackie no I, I should have perhaps reference this at the beginning that you know, you say from a research background, you hear, hear the word pilot. We're almost sort of looking at piloting from two lenses, aren't we? We're looking at a pilot of something that has been proven. It's safe. It's efficacious. It's got the evidence behind it. But you're testing it in Cornwall because it's only really been, say, implemented and done the research and evidence, say, in London or in Manchester, whatever. And you're, you're versus you could also actually be a, a research pilot. So you've done your prototype, you built your prototype, and now you're actually piloting it for the first time, which, of course, might lead to a uh, a trial or a, a further study, depending on obviously the level of evidence that, that is required. Uh, so I just really appreciate at the beginning. And I, I think that's important as well as a distinction because the different types of skills are required in different types of piloting. Um, I think where, you know, the evidence is still to be generated, I think that discipline around process management, really making sure that information is captured effectively, um, you know, having those mechanisms in place. You do need somebody that's probably quite analytical, uh, thinking of, of that personality type. Um, but you know, it's um, perseverance is probably the, one of the key things that I've I've definitely seen in great piloters uh, because it does take a lot to make one of these things work, and you you do really need to lean in uh, to the unknown, and, and that can and, and live with a bit of uncertainty, um, uh, which I think is is it's really hard for folks, especially in our current context uh, with so much change about us. Um, so conscious of time and um, uh, we've had uh, some great comments and things and I wonder if we could perhaps pause and uh, just pick up uh, if there's any more questions and maybe uh, offer it to the floor if anybody wants to come in with their own experiences uh, of pilotitis, uh, the dangers of it and, and any successes that folk want to, to reference. Uh, so, um, uh, Lorenzo, did you want to? Well, I was just going to say, whilst whilst people are writing, um, and yes, as Will says, do do please ask us any questions. Put them in the chat, and all come to, down. Yeah, to 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 address one thing that that you have kind of touched on, Will, but I realised I didn't answer when you said, you know, what what um. criteria, <laughs> and it's true for for both of the different types of pilot that that you were talking about is having really clear and mutually shared and agreed criteria for success and when you're doing that sort of research based then you know sometimes that's actually easier to do because you can say okay you know we're going to research a problem and prototype a solution and then these are the questions we want answered it's actually gets a bit more complicated when you're in that other scenario when you say well the technology is proven we know that that works and it's demonstrated but we're going to pilot it in this new location in in Birmingham or wherever and you say okay what are the criteria for success because actually the easy and obvious ones sometimes are wrong we've done a number of of projects where we said you know actually counterintuitively if this is a success it may actually increase the workload for example in primary care but it will uh, reduce workload in other parts of the overall health and social care system. So let's all agree that and acknowledge that at the start and not be surprised by that and understand and agree, well, what does success look like and have that end point as a part of your guiding light as, as you're working through a project. Really, really like that, Lorenzo. Um, and um, just just looking at some of the comments uh that that i've got here so emma nichols really great comments recognizing that culture behavioral change is an important part of any project where we're introducing something new i think how they say culture eat culture eats pilots for breakfast i mean uh, so, so 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 true of so many things isn't it culture eats strategy all that sort of stuff but it's so hard to pin down what makes uh, an effective culture and it, one of the phrases i worked with a great culture expert actually called matt hill whom i really do promote he's fantastic Nephesis down in Darrington has written a national toolkit actually on culture within hospitals and he talks about culture is very local 
and often a small team, a receptionist team in a private, you know, uh, it's a, you know, it's actually very local. It's not a big organizational culture. So you have to get really quite local in piloting to really understand those cultures. Uh, but absolutely ignore it at your peril, to, to quote Lorenzo earlier. Uh, setting out clear out anticipated outcomes and spending time on realizing the benefits, really important to help them inform the business case. I often encourage folk innovators or teams testing to go and speak to their procurement people, get that business case template right at the beginning to really understand what are the questions. <laughs> it seems really obvious, but how many pilots are actually done? And they realize, oh, God, I didn't even think that that actually needed to be on a framework or I had no idea that that was one of the return on investment questions that were part of our, you know, and often piloting teams, you know, be, you know, might not be aware of their procurement teams in their organizations or, you know, but, you know, so I think absolutely being really clear and actually getting, you know, getting the business case almost what what is a successful business case right at the beginning and what are the questions that this pilot's got to answer obvious stuff but amazing how often it's it's overlooked uh, and then um i think just a bit further uh just looking highlighting how the product will benefit the staff on the ground is useful yeah so really really thinking about those things is there any other does anybody um online want to jump in with any any other reflections or questions? Put you on the spot now. I think you can mute yourselves, can you, Lorenzo, or unmute yourself? Or is that not possible? Um, that's a very good question. Oh, you, if you can't, I'm so sorry. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. I I don't know. The I don't think you can. So I'm offering you an opportunity which isn't actually afforded to you. So I'm sorry for that. But yeah, do keep putting any questions or chats uh, in in the chat box. But. Um, Jackie, Lorenzo, um, in our last few minutes, is there any um, pearls of wisdom, resources, things that you'd encourage or advocate folk to look at? Uh, we've talked about some good examples. It may be great to add those in if, there, if there's any published material on them. Um, I often think with published case studies, you don't always get the real warts and all how it was done. So this is so important, this webinar, because you, you know, you're really getting into the, the nitty gritty of them. Uh, but is there any kind of pearls of wisdom or things that you'd signpost people to look at uh, that that can shed further light on 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 moving out of pilotisis? Um, Lorenzo, I, think the, oh, I thought the theory of change is really important. Theory of change, logic change. models. Yeah, absolutely, is a really good one, particularly and that PDSA cycle. Um, and you studying out like it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Because it's it's really what you're doing, isn't it? Particularly, so that's a really good way of, um, of finding out whether it's working or not, and then sort of try something else. Really good. So a bit of a, a nod to implementation science and QI and that sort of stuff. Mm. But so so integral, and uh, perhaps we can put a link in for folks to look at that. Lorenzo, any any pearls of wisdom and resources? Um, I I'd, I'd agree with what Jackie said. I, I think the only other thing I'd add to it is just having really, really good project management and understanding that you need to kind of really sweat the detail and, and get into that the, the day to day implementation of, of a project. And there there are many good resources out there in terms of agile project management, um, as, as well as kind of the more traditional types. But I think kind of trying to just dispel that idea that you know we we can just create a pilot and that solves a problem and understanding that if you're going to take this on you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and, and and get your hands dirty is a much healthier and slightly more sober but arguably ultimately more successful approach really helpful and so jackie did you want to yeah also you can't do it on your own no lone wolves no lone wolves it's a team sport yeah it's yeah, yeah if you want to, if you want to try and implement something you absolutely need a team around you you yeah it could be a brilliant idea but there's got to be um help there to be able to do it to get your vision over the line yeah and there's some great resources i see you mentioned quality improvement there jackie but really suggest looking at the institute for healthcare improvement in the states so that's particularly for imp improvement or implementation of pilots in health and social care context but outside of that i'm sure it's useful too but they often talk about really thinking about your team at the outset of a pilot uh, or a project you know really thinking about have you got the whole team mix the personalities that we've reflected uh your, your analytical your creative your different sort of personality profiles that's so integral um any like, well, last resort i'll put a few links in but i really love the work of the billions institute in america I referenced it before and things i've written 
Uh, this is a team of people that have scaled innovation across every sector you could think of, including homelessness, um, uh, looking at implementing um, all sorts of health care interventions across all sorts of places around the world. And they've synthesized good practice on how do you lead large scale change uh, and how do you how do you scale something? And I really love the the writings of people like Becky Margetta that are in that team. Uh, and it's really applicable to any any sector. Becky worked in homelessness and scaled a project that was uh, designed in New York City that got really chronic homeless people into permanent housing. And she then scaled it across every part of America. Uh, uh, it was called 100,000 Homes. It was phenomenal. Uh, lots of challenges in it, but she's written and, and, and the, the, the Billings Institute talk a lot about it. And I like it because it talks a lot about the human side. Uh, actually, you know, right at the thrust of this stuff is human beings trying to make a difference. And, it, and it's very empathetic to, to, to folk at the heart of these pilots. Uh, and I'll put a few links to some of the things that we in the Health Innovation Network have published around thinking about the conditions, thinking about those business cases, thinking about the sort of uh, the key key ingredients, if you like, you need to have uh, uh, on your journey to, to scaling something. So I'll put a put a couple of things in there for you. Uh, last last uh, thought, I just want to say thank you, Lorenzo, for, for putting these together as an innovator. I do often think, because not all pilots necessarily are a collaboration between an innovator and external SME, uh, there could be an innovation within an organisation, within the NHS, but often they are. And I, I just wanted to sort of say thank you, because at, at the heart often of these things is a, is a small business or a medium business uh, that is sacrificing a huge amount. And I, I think I saw the phrase othering in the chat earlier about, uh, you know, actually we need to sort of think of ourselves as a team. Um, but I, I, I just want to recognise that as a small business, it's really challenging. And, um, uh, you know, so thanks for putting these and uh, showing a bit of leadership in, in getting conversations like this to, uh, happening. So thank you. <laughs> Did you want well, to say uh, last word? I was just going to say thank you to yourself and Jackie for, thank you to you for hosting it, Will and, and Jackie for attending, Re really appreciate it. And, and thank you for those joining. Um, it is an ongoing, as you say, an ongoing discussion, an ongoing kind of collaboration that, uh, we're proud to to be part of and, and to show our commitment to. So so thank you everyone for supporting us. Thanks Jackie for joining us uh, uh, from uh, out, stepping out of your piloting for a moment to, to talk about piloting. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>